Well, good morning and welcome to Worship with Lake Forest Church. So glad you could be here, whether you're with us in the room, hanging out at a friend's house or at home online or out in the pergola. We feel like the stuff we're gonna talk about today is incredibly important in our culture in this time, especially as followers of Jesus. We're gonna be talking about justice. And we're gonna have a chance to hear from an African-American ministry partner, his experiences. We're gonna have a Q&A with another ministry partner who happens to be a lieutenant who is, dare I say, doing it right. And most importantly, we're gonna to get to hear from God's word, what he has to say on issues of justice. So we are so glad you're with us. Why don't we start the only way we really can, by recognizing how good our God really is. So would you all, wherever you are, please stand to your feet as we worship him in spirit and truth. All right, let's sing together, here we go. Oh, 
astounded at your love. God, that, that you would chase us down wherever we may go. And, and even as many of us uh, as a nation, this past Friday, God, we, we remembered in mourning and grief the tragic events of 9-11. And God, many of us even uttered the words, never forget. As a reminder of that grief, it took on a new tone in our current situation, God, where, where so many of us are grieving loss of every kind due to pandemic or, or, or tension and strife, God, and, and it, it touched us deeply. And so we ask that you would help us also, God, to never forget your hope. God, the hope of the unity that you showed, Lord, the light that you shined in such a dark time and you still shine today. And so God, that is my prayer for each and every one of us today that before anything else, we would find your light and give us the ability to shine that light to others in your love. We ask these things in your name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, so welcome again to worship with Lake Forest Church. If we haven't met, my name's Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and it's important that you know that whether you gave your heart to Jesus 30 years ago, 30 seconds ago, or you're still thinking about it, there is a place for you here. What we do here is we love people as they discover and live out their role in God's story. And everybody has a role in God's story. Another thing we do around here a lot is pray. And so if you have a burden, uh, please feel free. You can put that in the comment section if you're online. There's, on, there's live online hosts to help with that. Or you can uh, send us your request at prayer at lakeforest.org. We would love to be able to pray for you. Another thing this church is really good at is being faithful and generous. Seems like we say it every week because it keeps being true. But thank you. Because your continued giving allows us to impact this community in ways that, that hopefully draw people closer to God. So if you call Lake Forest home and you would like to worship God by giving a tithe and offering, you can go to lakeforest.org backslash give, or you can use the text to give information on your screen below. Uh, what we try to do, and I'm going to try and do real briefly this morning, is just give you a snapshot of some ways you can connect in community, grow in your relationship with God beyond Sunday morning here at Lake Forest. Uh, and so I want you to know that even though this is a weird fall, it is fall, and this week our, our Lake Forest Discovery Courses, our classes, uh, including our Women's Oasis Bible Studies, a lot of those are going to be launching this week. There is a great selection of offerings, something for everybody, so you can go and check out the information and find registrations at lakeforest.org backslash LFCH classes. Uh, also, a lot of people have reached out to me and say, hey, how can I be loving my neighbor and pouring into others here in the Huntersville area? We have a great opportunity for that. We're partnering with Caterpillar Ministries in their new initiative called My Path. And the idea is they're trying to find 20 to 30 uh, excited and energetic men or women to come alongside high school students and help them navigate high school into secondary education or life after high school and really help set them on their path. That sounds like you and you'd like some information on that, go to lakeforest.org backslash my path. I also want to just mention quickly that last weekend we celebrated a birthday, right? We launched a year ago our first Spanish-speaking congregation, El Buen Samaritano, which means the Good Samaritan, right here in Huntersville, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the two things I will say is, is your prayers, donations, and support have been incredible. And watching Pastor Victor and Rosemi love that community through this pandemic has been nothing short of amazing. Uh, so that is something for us all to celebrate. Uh, and then finally, the last thing that we're going to say this morning is that the topic that we're talking about is, is super important. right? And so I don't want to take up more of your time. Uh, so I'm going to throw it over to Pastor Mike so that he can get us going. Hey, Lake Forest, uh, you know, it's super hopeful for me to gather with you in worship here on the Sabbath day and to sing about the love of God, but I have to say the most hopeful thing for me right now is seeing some Panthers jerseys live <laughs> and in person on a Sunday. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> At home, you know you stayed home this morning, not just because of the pandemic, but so you could get your nachos on early. <laughs> That's why you're worshiping at home today. I would be too if, if I weren't Pastor Mike. 
Okay, we're going to start with the law of radical love as defined by Jesus. Would you please stand? We're going to read a little bit of God's Word here. Would you please stand in honor? And at home, please stand. This is part of how you get your worship on at home. you got to do the thing. you got to light the candles to signify the Holy Spirit and the communion of all saints. And you got to stand for the reading of God's Word and for singing. Okay, we're all standing here. You're standing there. Matthew 5, Jesus defines love radically. If anyone, Let's all read this together. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. Friends, Jesus says, uh, you can be seated. Jesus says, if a person asks you to carry something one mile, you carry it too. If a person asks for your coat, uh, you give them your shirt. And that's for an enemy he's talking about. Black. Christians, who I'm friends with, most specifically black Christian pastors in our city are asking me personally, and I'm passing along to you, to do something. They're asking us to do something. And Jesus says, if a person asks you to do it, you do it. And I want to do it as Jesus commands me. I want to do it maybe even twice. Jesus said, if he asks you one, you do two. So I want to go to two. And I want you to. In light of recent public videos highlighting the unjust treatment of black people in America, all of us are paying attention in a new way. Most white Christians I know here at Lake Forest have gone the first mile acknowledging there are vast inequities in our country according to race. And I want to say, well done. My black pastor friends are asking, go a second mile. Listen to us, understand us, listen to understand, not to argue, listen to fully understand and inhabit that view and experience. And where you do find inequity or justice, my friends are asking, and I'm passing it along to you, join us to make change in a better nation for all of us with greater justice for all. Today, since the majority of our worshiping tribe today are white Christians, I want to say, let's go the second mile, as Jesus says his followers will do if we really belong to him. Let's go the second mile and be those who not just listen, but do justice when it comes to racial inequities in our midst. White Christians, I'm I'm asking you, I'm talking to you specifically, do, do you feel a bit forced by society, by protests, by the media, by pro sports, do you feel a bit forced to think and talk about racial justice today? Tough nuggies. <laughs> Jesus said, when somebody asks you, you do it, and then you do it times two. And especially when someone you love says, we have a big stinking problem. You pay attention to it and you make it your problem. Do I want to think about this all the time? No. Do I want to think about this at the kickoff of the Panthers today? No, but I will. Because people I love say it's a problem. I need to make it my problem, just like I would if Angie comes to me and says, we have a problem in our marriage. Let's not be Pollyanna about the actual suffering. Of black Americans. Let's do as Jesus said. And do what's asked of us. So in our series. Back to life. I promise I'm not going to cry the whole time. But I might. In our series back to. This is tender for. since I was a teenager. So in our series, Back to Life, as we emerge from pandemic spring, from pandemic summer, and doggone it, is a pandemic fall. We're talking in this series about parts of our lives that we can control. There's a lot that's out of our control. But one thing we can control and do something about is will I be a Christian who does what Jesus says and what the Bible says and be somebody who cares about justice? And specifically because we're more aware of it 
than we were a year ago, racial justice and equity in America. Will I control that part of my life and actually be about of that, about that in my new normal? So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to listen to two black Christian men for a moment. First, Andrew Lovedale. He played ball with Steph Curry at Davidson, sat under the balcony over there back in the day here at Lake Forest, and today he's a Lake Forest ministry partner. He's going to recount some of his experiences as a black man in Lake Norman. And then Harrison's friend and our musical guest today, Alex King, will share a song that Alex wrote, and he invited Harrison in on it. Then I'm going to teach what the Bible says about justice as far as I can tell. And then we're going to look at how that played out in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 5. You can go ahead and open your Bible to Nehemiah 5. And then we'll try to apply it just for a moment. And when worship is over, joining me for live Q&A at the end of this service uh, is a lieutenant of Huntersville Police Department and a member of our worship team today, uh, Brian Vaughn. So that's what we're doing. Here we go. successful, handsome if my, I may say, uh, uh, leadership-oriented black man in Lake Norman, you posted some of your experiences of direct personal racist encounters. And would you tell us these events here in our area? Yeah, well, I, uh, for me, growing up, one my approach to things, you know, my, I, would, I would credit this to my mother who always said, you know, no matter what people say to you or about you, if it doesn't take a strand out of your hair, then it, it shouldn't really bother you. So, um, I was driving a, a, a young woman, one of our scholars from Nigeria, and we were heading to the African store to go get supplies. Um, and, and just driving and talking about life, and uh, this car drives past us. and. Uh, you know, a young kid, probably 13, 14, I'm not sure his age, you know, he just brings his hands out of the car and, you know, acts like he's shooting at us. Wow. Um, and that kind of got to me. I wasn't sure if Uche saw that. Um, and I just kind of thought about it. Maybe it was nothing, you know. And then I saw the dad doing the same thing in the driver's seat. Really? Um, so I just thought, oh, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe there was something. But then um, they drove past us, and then there was another black man in a car in front of a truck, and they did the exact thing. Oh. Uh, and Uche looked at me and said, did you see that? Uh, and I said, yes. I can't imagine. Exactly. I really can't imagine that. Andrew, you wrote about uh, that. We could just say, well, that was just some guy yeah. who's crazy, came, like I just said, came down out of the hills. Yeah. You've had a, a few other incidents that you wrote about. Could you name those other encounters? I mean, I, I played basketball. Um, you know, I've, I, I think it was 2007 tournament, um, right on the basketball court. Uh, a now prominent basketball player in the NBA, uh, while I was guarding him, uh, called me a monkey, right? That is something that, um, you know, a lot of players might go through or athletes might go through that you don't hear. The mics do not pick them up, right? But these things happen. Um, or, I mean, I live in a, a neighborhood here in town, and um, for the most part, my neighbors are nice. But I do have neighbors that wouldn't say, I do, it's, it's the one particular neighbor, I would say, that doesn't even respond when I say hello, right? And, wow. you know, I, I, I was raised not to be a to allow those things affect me. So inside of me, I always tell myself, it doesn't matter what you do, I'm going to keep saying hello. Um, so every time I drive by, every time she walks her dog by, I still say hello, and I don't get a response back. So, um, so th those are some of my experiences. And you know, being a father to a child, and um, you know, for the first year of my son's life, I, I worked from home, because my wife is, is an attorney, and she's very busy. So I, I, I still go to the grocery store a lot today, uh, and I had him, uh, and I took him to the grocery store, and uh, and just walking by. This is your son. This is my son Osas, and just walking past, um, two young men walked by, and they just stopped in their track and just kept staring at me and staring at my son, like almost you know comparing. Because is your son present yeah, as white? Exactly. Does he look that so, way? Okay. Yeah, and if you know Osas, Osas is very light. <laughs> okay. So, 
Um, so it's just giving me the look like, did you steal this child, right? So I, I basically just had to look at them, right? Like, this is my son, you know, and, and walk into the store. Wow. And these are things that we oftentimes don't notice, but it, it makes you feel uncomfortable um, a little bit where you have to look out for, look out for these things. The fact that um, these and other incidences of personal racism have happened to you right here in Lake Norman, which is why I think I wanted to have this conversation. How do you handle this, Andrew? How, how do you not become embittered? Uh, or do you struggle with bitterness? Um, how do you, what is your response to this as a person? Um, I think what I, I remind myself that my faith needs to come before my rage. Um, and, and oftentimes we, we get enraged by things happening. And I think that oftentimes is where we lose, uh, where we lose our track. And I'm always reminded of the gift of the forgiveness that Jesus has given me, has given everyone. And, and I understand that each day that I get an opportunity to go out, I feel like when you look at yourself in the mirror, the things that you need to ask is how, how deep is your well of forgiveness, right? How, uh, when you think about justice, it's like how, how much depth do you have when it comes to pursuing justice or making sure that justice prevails, right? And, and when you think through these things and you look at yourself in the mirror, it helps you to go out and try to reflect Christ and, and not just put yourself in, in front. Um, that usually is the approach that I take and understanding that the weapons that we have always used to fight things like this creates a cycle. And it just goes round and round. And if Jesus has taught us anything, anything it's you can't fight hate with hate. Right?
Thank you, Alex Harrison and the band. Does God care about justice? Does God call his people to care about justice? What is biblical justice as opposed to many theories of justice that are floating around in culture and in media? Uh, would you stand again and let's read God's word together? At home, come on now. You are in worship of the living God right now. Stand to honor God's word and let's read this one aloud. Micah 6, 8. Let's go. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Okay, I got it. God requires me to not just love justice, not think about justice, but to do it. Deuteronomy 16, 20. Stay standing, and let's read this together. Deuteronomy 16, 20 from the lips of Moses himself. <laughs> Follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. And then through the prophet Amos in the Hebrew Scriptures, Amos 5, 23. Take, all together, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You may be seated, although I'm going to ask you to read another scripture. If you'll keep that one on screen there for me for a moment. You know what God is saying right there? He's like, I don't want to hear you singing worship songs and nodding your head and typing your feet and think you're living my way as a godly person. That's privatization of faith. Do justice in the public square and in your relationships as an act of worship to God. That's what God is saying through Amos to the people of God in his generation. Now, finally, Jesus is going to tell us that justice is the more mature Christian thing to care about and do. He's going to say it's more advanced than tithing. How y'all doing with tithing? He's going to say this is even more godly and spiritual to do whatever justice is. Uh, Matthew 23, 23. Will you, will you all read this aloud with me? And at home, it's super important that you read it aloud even if you feel dumb. Here we go. Matthew 23, 23. Let's get that one on the screen. Oh, there it is. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And today we're going to focus on justice. Uh, how can we define biblical justice? I have researched a lot of experts and saw a lot of definitions, saw a lot of people talking about it without defining it, which was interesting to me, Bible teachers. And here's a definition that I think is the most accurate from World Vision, which is a ministry that exists to do justice for the poor worldwide. Here's their definition. I'll put it on screen for you. You can screenshot it if you want. Biblical references to the word justice mean to make right. Justice is, first and foremost, a relational term. People living in right relationship with God one another, and the natural creation. As God is just and loving, so are we called to do justice and live in love. Okay, so justice is relational regarding God, one another, and even the created order. But what does that mean in actionable terms? Well, there's a helpful common way of breaking down what the Bible teaches about justice. And I want to give you these three aspects of biblical justice, and then we're going to look through the Nehemiah chapter 5 and see how these play out. And so the first aspect of biblical justice is retributive. Okay, I'm going to respect your intellect today and use some SAT words. Uh, you're welcome, high schoolers. Retributive justice, which is giving people what they rightly deserve, both reward and punishment. So if you work hard and you do well, you should be rewarded with an increasing wage. If you protest, for racial equity peacefully, the reward should be the ability to do so unmolested in a democracy like ours. If you destroy property and threaten other people in a form of rioting, the reward should be arrest by law enforcement. This is reward and punishment. Punishment, if you break the law, you should be held accountable and pay for your crime. This is the best known and most understood aspect of justice period and of biblical justice, but it's not the only aspect. Also, in a fallen world, because we're sinful people, the retributive aspect of justice must be held accountable for equal outcomes for rich and poor, native and immigrant citizens, and in America, what we're talking about today, and I'm just naming it, black and white. Uh, just this morning, I went way down the rabbit hole 
reading a published study by the University of Michigan Law School that can, when you control factors for, uh, uh, of uh, law offenders, people who have committed an actual crime, when you control factors for the same crime, same circumstances, same severity, that their finding was that black men statistically get higher initial charges, they get less options for plea deals and longer sentences than other races in America, controlling for other factors. You can Google that if you want as part of your listening to the black experience. It's a paper, uh, research paper titled uh, uh, Racial Disparity in Federal Crime Sentences by the University of Michigan Law School. Retributive justice is a necessary biblical function of government, but in a fallen world, it must be carefully overseen, corrected, and stewarded to be truly just, like every other part of our lives. So the first aspect of justice is retributive, and we kind of all get that. The second aspect of biblical justice that's taught throughout scriptures is restorative, and that's healing victims, restoring offenders, repairing harm done to persons and to the community. Uh, prison fellowship is a great ministry example of restorative justice in America today. They educate, they inform, they teach the Bible to, and they train inmates in jails all across America, a productive trade, so that when they reenter society, they can earn their own way. This ministry, Prison Fellowship, uh, was started by Chuck Colson, a Christian man who served time for his own criminal activity in Watergate all the way back in the 70s. Here's a statement by Prison Fellowship because it illustrates this restorative nature of justice so well. Changing prisoners and families through the power of Christ. Crime takes a, tool, a, a toll on victims, communities, and taxpayers. Prisons alone turn few lives around, but when a prisoner's life transforms, it changes the story for everyone. It's beautiful. Restorative justice. I bet there are some of you in here who may have volunteered with prison, prison fellowship. You may donate to them. That is restorative justice at its best. And I wonder if any of you who follow international news, did you follow the workings of the, I think it was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa for over a decade? Uh, they painstakingly attempted to restore community uh, trust in the whole nation of South Africa by stating the truth of what apartheid had cost individuals in society. And there was like societal-wide national confession repentance and reconciliation, a beautiful, powerful model for our world, and it was constructed by Christian ministers who put that process together. How beautiful. Not perfect. Uh, so, so justice is uh, retributive. Can you say retributive with me? How about just the children in the room? Can you say retributive? Okay, that was pretty good. Uh, it's also, justice is also restorative. Will you say restorative? Okay, and biblical justice is also distributed, num distributive number three. This is the just allocation of resources among members of a community. This principle is that every person should have access to a minimum level of material goods and services that are available in any given society. And every society makes decisions about what level is to be distributed and available to every citizen, regardless of their status. For example... In ancient Israel, in biblical history, uh, individuals were prevented from owning the only well in town because access to water, they decided, must be distributed equally to every citizen. Here's a, a common sense example. In our country, um, I don't know who decided this and when, but at some point our nation decided that beaches must be distributed <laughs> equally to citizens. So not all beachfront property is allowed for sale to private ownership so that all of us, not just people who can afford beachfront property, we can go to the beach. That's a distribution. Does it, does it, it kind of make sense as a common sense example of this aspect of biblical justice? Uh, in America today, we are debating vigorously how much access to health care is a resource that should be distributed evenly to every citizen or not. And this aspect of biblical justice connects to our Constitution by asking the question, what is the most just way to ensure that all may enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? So that not only the, the powerful or the wealthy have minimum uh, resources like access to roads, 
electricity, internet, clean drinking water, etc. And you can see, you can trace through our history. We've gotten better at distributing the access to voting, right? And initially, it was white males who owned property. And then that, vo- that right was extended to all uh, white males, I guess, and then it was extended to women, and then in the 1960s to all persons, including persons of color. And so, this is an ongoing discussion in every society, and we are having these discussions today. Now, you have the categories, uh, okay, retributive, restorative, distributive. Pop quiz, can you say that with me? Retributive, restorative, distributive. Let's try it again. Retributive, restorative, distributive. Okay, now that we have the categories, let's study through Nehemiah chapter 5 together. We've been going through Nehemiah in this series because they're trying to get the the people of God and the city of Jerusalem back to life from being in ruins, and we're coming back to life this fall in areas of life we can control. And so let's see how Nehemiah handles matters of doing justice in the the words of Micah 6, 8. Okay, Nehemiah 5, starting with verse 1. The rest of this time, except for right at the end, when I need to talk, point you to Jesus, uh, I'm going to be in Nehemiah chapter one, 5, and we're just going to walk right through it. Now, the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Okay, they're in the middle of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There were a lot of the, the, uh, the people of God, the, the nation of Israel, who had stayed around Israel, even, uh, Jerusalem even when it had been conquered by the Babylonians. And now a bunch of them have come back from captivity in Babylon, and they're all rebuilding the city together. Uh, Now, the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we need grain, bread. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Okay, this is not playing around. Some serious stuff going on here. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved. And there's there's, uh, some, uh, we're not sure if that word there in the Hebrew is enslaved or even something worse. But we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Verse 6. Would you read verse 6 aloud with me? When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. This is Nehemiah, the leader of the people of God. And what biblical and historical scholars tell us, the justice issue here, is it was legal, yes, to charge a small amount of interest on loans. If the people trying to set up their farm or their household needed a little loan to get started, it was legal to charge a small interest, and it was legal to take an asset like clothing or a chicken from the person who needed the loan. It was legal to demand an asset as security for that loan. But what was immoral and unjust in this situation that Nehemiah was just finding out about, the rich were charging inordinate, and and these were the ones who had already been living. These are the returnees feeling that they are being unjustly uh, related to, uh, is the rich were charging inordinate interest on the loans, and worse, as security for these loans, they were demanding the working people's This is the working class here that are complaining. They were demanding that the working people hand over their son or their daughter as a servant or a slave while they owed the rich the money. And you know what the God-honoring response is to something that unjust to human, from one human to another or from a system to an individual in the system? The human human response is Nehemiah, verse 6, I was very angry. Anger is the right response in the face of of injustice, to being treated unfairly in society. And so, let's act like Nehemiah did. And he he says he was very angry. Let's say, I'm going to say, that ain't right, to quote Chris Rock. Uh, Would you say with me, that ain't right? That ain't right. (laughs) Friends, here's what every person at Lake Forest Church who I've spoken with agrees on. Whether you're someone who thinks that there is an ongoing systemic aspect to inequities in our country according to race, or if you're one of the Lake Forest people I've met with who does not see evidence of current and ongoing systemic injustice as basis for economic and opportunity inequity for black Americans, 
Every person agrees the inequities are real. And we all agree that ain't right. Can we say it again? That ain't right. And we want to see it healed. And we want to be part of the solution. We don't have to agree on how we got here. But we need to be part of the solution to do justice. Uh, Here's one example. The unemployment from Fortune magazine. The unemployment rate among black workers has topped 10% in 405 months or 69.6% of the time since the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics started calculating it in 72. Meanwhile, the white unemployment rate has topped double digits in only three months during that same period or 0.5% of the time. Will you say with me that ain't right? That ain't right. Now, here's good, some good news, actually. Uh, my black Christian friends celebrate that, like, as recent as 2019, black unemployment shrank to 6% for the first time. Wonderful progress, really good improvement. And yet it was still twice as high as white unemployment at 3%. And so, great, we're moving we, we, my black Christian friends celebrate the immense progress that's been made in our country regarding race relations since Jim Crow laws. But other measures of equity are moving in the wrong direction still. Home ownership among black Americans has gone down in the past decade. It's at a low right now over several decades. And so doing justice means we don't say good enough. Do you accept that, somebody building something in your house? Man, I forgot my leveler. That wall looks good enough. It looks straight enough. (laughs) You're not going to accept that as a customer, and we will not accept it with justice. Uh, Next slide. At $171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. Perhaps you've seen this statistic. If not, you need to see it. At $17,000 in 2016, that remains to this day. The numbers will be a little different. Gaps in wealth between black and white households reveal the effects of accumulated inequality and discrimination uh, that can be traced back through our history. Will you say with me, that ain't right? That ain't right. And in verse 6, Nehemiah said he was very angry. Let's move on to verse 7, Nehemiah 5, verse 7. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. And the word there also involves the pledge of security here that's so unjust. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. He called a meeting. As far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet. They could find nothing to say. Here's what Nehemiah shows us as a man after God's heart from Nehemiah chapter 1. He's aware of problems out there in the world, and he first goes to God, and then he goes and does something about it. And we learn from Nehemiah here, if the source of injustice against a person or a class of persons can be clearly clearly identified, that source is to be vigorously confronted, and he confronts it. Uh, Identify when justice is being violated. In this case, the new arrivals back from captivity in Babylon were being unjustly denied equal access to capital, to property, and to the free, uh, uh, the free exercise of their family, the free labor. Uh, it was techni- uh, So he surfaces it and he calls it out, says, this ain't right. He didn't just say it to himself and the Lord. He says it to the people running the system. Verse 9. So I continued, this is Nehemiah's account, what you're doing, it ain't right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? In other words, we look just like everybody else, and we're supposed to be the people of God who know Yahweh, the eternal father of us all. Injustice is not right, Nehemiah says here, because it's tied to offending the character of God. Nehemiah ties walking with God in awe, fear, respect, and worship. He ties it with acting rightly, justly. Regarding, make no mistake here, these issues are issues of employment, economics, and citizenship. This is why I chose this chapter. I just think it, it, it plays out that this is stuff in the real world. 
Why is it tied to who God is? Because God is a God of justice. He's a God of retributive justice. Because God is the God who says, vengeance is mine. You don't take vengeance. That's mine. I will have vengeance. And he says, I will judge at the end of time. And I will hand out rewards and penalties. And I trust God because of that. Because he's a God of retributive justice. He is also a God of restorative justice. He made our bodies so they can self-heal. Mine's healing a little more slowly these years. Uh, he leads his people to set wrongs back to right in their sphere of influence and to heal. And he promises that one day he will wipe every tear and heal all suffering when Jesus returns and inaugurates the new heavens and the new earth. And God is a God of distributive justice. As Jesus said, God makes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on those who worship him and those who don't. Whether you're a Christian, a Buddhist, or an atheist, God has distributed to you the ability to experience joy every time a puppy licks your face. And I hope you've had that joy recently because we need any source of joy right now. Justice is not derived from frail human nature. And any theory that ties justice to human nature and human reason alone will fail us and will become some source of, of new authoritarianism. It is derived from the character of the living God who's revealed himself to us through the scriptures and ultimately through his son, Jesus Christ. Praise him. I'm thankful that I know God and trust him through Jesus so I can trust him for justice to be done at the end of history and therefore I don't become enraged. And I'm thankful for my friend Andrew you heard in the video. He has not given in to rage because he's experienced the justice of God for his own sins through forgiveness paid for by God himself as Jesus, the God-man, gave his life up on the cross for Andrew's sins, for mine, for yours, and has redeemed it. Verse 10, Nehemiah 5. <clears throat> I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. Let us stop charging interest. And again, the phrase here also involves what what thing of value you give for security for a loan. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. That 1% translated to 12% over a year. Uh, we will give it, which the Bible says is unjust. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Okay, this is every aspect of biblical justice. Retributive, they get a spanking from their leader, Nehemiah. Because uh, Jerusalem at this point is kind of like the wild, wild west. Wild, wild west was in America. And Nehemiah is kind of like the marshal. There's like one guy who's got the authority because it's like that. And he gives them a spanking. That's retributive. They're labeled as wrongdoers. They are penalized. They have to pay a penalty by giving back resources. It's a hefty penalty, actually. And that's retributive justice. This is also restorative justice at work. Those who were economically harmed have what was unjustly taken from them returned to them. Notice Nehemiah doesn't say, okay, well, let's just, let's just start from where we are today and make it right from now on. He goes back and makes it right for the people who've been injured, which is interesting. But it's also distributive justice. Nehemiah, not, Nehemiah now makes what is, in effect, a law in this new territory, that, the, that the, the, the wealthy, the people holding the capital, can no longer charge exorbitant interest at the level of payday loans uh, to people with less money, and they can no longer demand human beings as a slave in exchange for a loan when the poor have no other choice. I, I need bread. Uh, so he makes a law in effect. That's distributive. How is this going to be distributed? How is access to... It's that specific. It's that real world. How will access to capital be distributed in the future? Our nation made some choices about how access to capital through real estate would be distributed in the middle of the 20th century. And, and African Americans were denied access to properties that would have increased in value, that were valuable or increased in value in that time. It's an example of there's, there's either just distribution uh, 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 or unjust. Uh, anyway, so this is all three of these. And so 
here's what's cool about Nehemiah. When injustice is identified, a God-centered person or leader works to effect change. Nehemiah was in charge so he could effect maximum change at maximum speed. You and I are not in charge of everything, <laughs> but we're in charge of our voice. We're in charge of our vote. We're in charge of justice in our household at a minimum. We're in charge of our voice as citizens of this town, this city, this state, this nation. And we're to use our voice to advocate for and effect change to a more just society. Verse 12, then I summoned uh, the priests and made the, the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep his promise. So may a person, such a person be shaken out and empty. And they all said, amen, and praise the Lord, and the people did as they promised. Uh, notice here that, that this justice uh, depends not just on, uh, yeah, so they made a, a promise. And then let me finish with verse 14 through 19, Nehemiah chapter 5. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed governor, neither I or my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor, even though he was the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people, took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. What a beautiful servant leader. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six sheep, <laughs> some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. Uh, that's the Presbyterian interpretation of that verse. The Baptist interpretation is abundant supply of grape juice of all kinds. Uh, in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Check this out. Here's a governor, a man, who understands that ordinary people have a heavy burden on them. That's verse 18. And, and biblical justice also includes personal responsibility. We can come back to me now. Biblical justice includes a personal responsibility, not just for the government. It includes the possibility of choosing to forego benefits for self even. That's what he did here for this period of time, so that others may have enough. And now his household, Nehemiah, that, that he describes pursuing justice personally with people, with the resources he had charge over, it's kind of like Nehemiah's startup company. Some of you maybe are in the middle of a startup or you own a business. It's kind of maybe the business unit he's in charge of. Many of you have charge over others in your workplace. Some of you are teachers. You have charge over a classroom. Uh, uh, maybe it's his equivalent of his medical practice. Whatever you have charge over in your work. Or if you're a teenager and you're on a sports team or a drama club and you're one of the leaders of that, he does justice. And we can do justice in our personal sphere like Nehemiah. Notice, he doesn't treat his work and the assets there like a pirate does. You ever known a piratical business leader? They see everything as booty for them to get more of. And it doesn't matter if employees have ridiculously low wages or no benefits. The pirate is going to take all the booty they can get. Nehemiah is the opposite. He wants to do personal justice. Well, Somebody told me this week, Mike, I agree with you, and I'm doing what black Christians have asked, and I'm listening to their story and their experience. But what if I still don't agree with most of my black friends about the causes of today's racial inequity? And I think we have a clear answer here from Scripture, Micah 6, 8. Do justice. Let's do justice. We can disagree about why there are inequities in our society according to race. So let's not argue about that. Let's pick an area where God has put on your heart, where there's inequity of resources and it appears to be sorted by race. And do justice about that thing. Can this be part of your new normal? we got new normal going on in every part of our life. New normal is to be a Christian who cares about injustice and who does justice by owning my voice and my actions as a result. Because what I know about every Lake Forest person listening to me 
is uh, all of us want to be part of the solution. Let's focus on solutions according to our definition of biblical justice. Something super cool that St. Augustine said back in the 400s A.D. He said this, Hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger at what is wrong, courage to help make things right. We're called into a time of courage, friends. As Patrick Mahomes said in a commercial during the first NFL game of the year Thursday night, praise Jesus, Oh, I'm so happy. As Patrick Mahomes said in a commercial, it's been a summer of protests. It's now about action for change. And I think we can come together on that. Tony Dungy, the great NFL coach at halftime, he's an outspoken Christian man. He said, this isn't about the flag. It's it's not only about black and white. It's about making our country a better place to live for everyone. And Christians are called to inspect where we hear there's injustice and do justice in return. So how do I do justice? Well, I can't tell you exactly what to do. That's not my role or my responsibility, and I don't know everything. (laughs) I know the biblical definition of justice, and that's about it. But, But if we succeed in one thing today, it would be to get a full biblical definition of justice in your worldview. So would you repeat with me? Biblical justice is retributive, restorative, and distributive. Will you say it with me? Biblical justice is retributive, restorative, and distributive. Will you say that with me one more time? Biblical justice is retributive, restorative, and distributive. Now, uh, just a couple of thoughts. One, you can do justice by ensuring fairness in your household. For example, if you're someone who doesn't allow your husband or wife to know the financial state of your household, that's unjust distribution of access to knowledge in the home. Uh, Number two, ensure fairness in your work, your school, your place, uh, wherever you find yourself. And number three, just advocate regionally and nationally for fair treatment and outcomes for black Americans. Let's be that specific because that's the specific problem that we're all grappling with right now. In the Bible, God consistently speaks up for those who are getting a raw deal in society. In Egypt, it was the Hebrews getting a raw deal, and God set them free. Once they moved into the promised land, God sent prophets to say over and over to the Hebrews, hey, give those who are poor equal access and treatment. Over and over, it's in the Hebrew prophets. And in America today, we are learning African Americans are statistically more disadvantaged or poorer, poorer, which should break all of our hearts that that is so. Just looking at that statistic breaks my heart. And so two points of hope. Two points of hope. Well, uh, one example, two points of hope. No, just two points of hope. (laughs) You know what Jeff announced earlier? There's a college mentoring team that Lake Forest has partnered with Caterpillar Ministries in, in uh, 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 serving a population in our community that generally has less access to higher education or vocational training after high school for various reasons. And a number of you have volunteered to be mentors to help a kid who does not have parents who know how to access uh, higher education. Some of you have volunteered to mentor a high school kid through that process over several years. And most of you, two years ago, we had our 20th anniversary of Lake Forest, most of you gave $20 for every person in your household who's been impacted for Lake Forest. Do you know what we did with that $20? We established an educational scholarship fund. Fund. You did it. And there are, I, I forgot to ask Angie how many. There are several kids from our local neighborhood who are engaging in secondary education or vocational, tra- vocational training today on the scholarship that you gave. Well done. That's doing justice. Like super well done. Let's do more of that. Here's one more point of hope. I've spoken with a couple of business owners going, man, I don't know what to do about all this. I know God has a responsibility on me with the the racial unrest and injustice. I don't want to get involved in all the politics stuff. I don't really agree with this or that or the other. What can I do? And I've got a couple of friends who who are business owners, really successful, going, here's what I can do to bring justice. 
the, the folks in my circles, ha, their, their teenagers have access to internship opportunities because I know doctors and lawyers and bankers. And so kids in my neighborhood have access. Distribu- it's distributed to them access to internships that get them into good colleges and that then put on a resume to get a good job out of college. And so my two business owner friends are like, why don't we start giving access to our internship network of kids growing up in West Charlotte who don't have access, the access to internships are not being distributed to them equally. Does that make sense? I think that's beautiful. I'm like, I want to be a part of that. So however God has called you, whatever is fear of life, to do justice. Here's the end. Because I have to, doesn't make sense without Jesus. Otherwise, this is all talk and human futility. Romans 3, verse 25. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that in your forbearance, you chose to not punish us for our sins, but to take the punishment yourself because you are a just God and sin will be punished. Thank you that Jesus bore that punishment on the cross on our behalf so that your justice was satisfied and we have been given new life in Christ. Help us like my friend Andrew to therefore do justice toward others out of a deep well of forgiveness that comes from being forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand to our feet together as we sing one song. Sing. 
Thank you so much, worship team. It's great to worship with you today. Great to worship with you today. If you would like to stick around, we're going to have a live Q&A with my friend. Uh, he was one of our vocalists today, uh, Lieutenant Vaughn of Huntersville Police Department. We're going to ask some questions about things we discussed in the message. Uh, also, we forgot to tell you earlier, this is super cool. Our parking lot is going to serve as a drive through COVID testing site for Atrium Health this Wednesday from 8 until 2 p.m. We're doing this as a service to our community, some of whom uh, members of our community don't know how to get testing, and so we're just making it super available in a partnership with Atrium. That's super cool. If you or someone you know is in need of a test, you can uh, find that on our website uh, for details about the testing procedures. If you're a kiddo heading to ministry uh, this morning, you are now dismissed, as is everyone. You can feel free to hang around for Q&A or, or jet on out. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be yours. Go in peace. Amen. stuff, y'all. Um, uh, we're in double overtime here today, it, keeping with the football theme. Uh, we're back to football, and I decided to make it a two-overtime worship service today. <laughs> uh, Brian, uh, how long have you been with Huntersville Police Department? Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to get the mic today. There we go. There you go. There it is. How long have you been with Huntersville uh, Police? I'm coming up on my 20th anniversary here at Huntersville PD and uh, been in law enforcement for 22 years. Uh, same amount of time I've been pastor here, and, and it's so interesting that until you guys joined Lake Forest, some, some good number of years ago, you and I, we figured out a couple of instances where we were probably at the scene of something not good together, but we didn't really know each other. Right. And you got me hooked then. <laughs> <laughs> the compassion that you showed there on some of those scenes that we had um, won us over. Wow. Um, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I've, I've shared some pretty intense moments with you and your colleagues uh, here in our town, and I'm grateful for you all. I'm proud of Huntersville Police, and uh, 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 I need to get to know the new chief, who was the old chief. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little overdue in doing that. I, I did that with the previous chief. Um, I'd love to just ask you a really direct question, and if we have some coming in on Facebook, that's fine. I'll ask you a really super direct question, and you and I have had conversations about this, so not a big surprise, but just jump right into it. A lot of the 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 protests, the the protests that were that were happening right now, 
and the movements for racial justice really were kicked off by another video of a police officer in Wisconsin uh, killing a man, like slowly on camera. And um, I've already talked with you about what that's like to see and, and be who you are in the face of that. Um, what is that like to be a police officer at this time? Uh, I think early on it was a little overwhelming. Um, Alex and I just had a real good conversation uh, backstage as well that um, it's easy. It, it, all good police don't like the bad ones to happen either. Um, yeah. And so uh, it was overwhelming at first, and uh, everybody's on the same page. I uh, want to see uh, justice for George Floyd and his family. Um, and then the other thing Alex and I talked about was just making sure that we ended up getting the whole story too. Um, you know, we get a 20 second, 30 second snippet of something that's happened and uh, you realize that there's a, maybe an hour's worth of snippet that needed to be seen. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it's important to know that, especially the people who have stuck around here this morning to listen, those of you listening online too, um, is that 80 to 90%, maybe 90% plus all want the same thing right now. Hmm. And we just got to drown out the 10% that's uh, getting the voice. Yeah. Um, well, even that is just helpful to hear you say. And uh, when it comes to, yeah, one of your colleagues told me, I, I called to check on him in the right aftermath of all this stuff. And he said, nobody hates a bad cop like a good cop, um, uh, was his number one response to me. And then it's very stressful at this time. I'm curious, uh, Brian, and you and I have talked about this a little bit. So there are, other than ridiculous <laughs> solutions like defund the police, excuse me, but I think that's ridiculous, um, uh, are, are there s some common sense or, or statistically proving reforms that could increase uh, justice in policing and trust in the minority community that generally, like Huntersville leader, you're in leadership in Huntersville Police, Generally, uh, you guys welcome in favor. Uh, is that a okay question? It is. Uh, we talked about it on the podcast here at mm -hmm. Lake Forest a couple months ago as well, um, is that uh, we need to spend more time and effort on training and making the police more effective in what they're doing. Um, we have gone for 30-plus years of relying on the police to solve uh, problems that community should be solving yeah. and that church should be solving and that um, psychologists should be solving and not police in the, um, and not police in the uh, last uh, we'll check this one okay. hello check that's working yeah that'll work um, yeah. so uh, we're, we've, we've spent the last 30 years putting more and more on our police um, to deal with and uh, now it's time we need. And Brian, that makes total sense to me. Like that's one of the most common sense changes that I that I uh, I hope that people can come together and advocate for. But honestly, one of the most hopeful things in statewide and national government has been uh, some criminal justice reforms, bipartisan, particularly sentencing reform, for example, that was done in a bipartisan way in our Congress. Like. Thank God, and there's been some of that in our state as well. I know as a young pastor, nobody trained me how to deal with extreme mental illness. And I, early on, I had some encounters with people who were losing touch with reality and uh, just because I was their pastor. And it was a huge learning curve to learn how to handle that. Um, and I can't imagine what that's like for you guys. Yeah, it's, it's the same. You and I have talked about this before. It's it's same but different. Um, you know, we are trying to arrest bad guys and take them to jail, but then also do those things that you're talking about just now. A question that came in for okay. you that came in through the online thing was, how do you know when to speak out and when not to speak out on these uh, things that are happening in the world today? Um, I, our elders talked about this here at Lake Forest Huntersville this week, and they said some really wise things. And one of our elders, uh, newer elders, who's going to be ordained later today, she said, um, when you speak out on social media, there's little to gain and a lot to lose. Uh, that uh, our, speaking out would be writing a letter to a, someone in government, organizing a campaign. Uh, if God has put on your heart one or two issues, and this, 
by the way, uh, racial reconciliation is an issue that God has uniquely put on my heart since at a young age. Um, I don't know why. And so I own it, and I speak out on it more frequently than other things. I just need to own that. Um, and those of you who have been here for very long kind of know that, and you, you, you tolerate me. Um, so I, I think it's you speak out like Nehemiah did. He saw an actual injustice, you name it. But he named it to the people that he named it in an environment that could bring change. He didn't run around the city going, those stupid, rich people charging invid and making slaves and stuff. He did something about it. So he, he spoke to the Lord first. He got angry. So he owned his righteous indignation. So if God gives you a heart for a certain issue, that's one of the ways you know this is your part of justice is you get angry. And then he went and did, yeah, so that's my answer to that. I, I think social media is the least important place to speak up about it. The least effective place to yeah. speak up it's, about uh, it. Now, everybody has a right, and, and uh, Jeff Cook made an observation that we're in an identity age, and so you may feel that to not say anything on social media is to be passive and not identify yourself as caring about this. That's fine, and that may be very important. But to shrilly go back and forth in a in a forum that's not going to change anything. In fact, it'll only change relationships for the worst. I, uh, again, going back to Alex and I's conversation in the back uh, while you were preaching, um, you know, we were saying that it's important for um, us to hear both sides. It's important for us to hear his experiences in life mm -hmm. and those things that we may not experience in the Lake Norman area. And it's also important for him to hear our experiences as well. And then that's the only way that we're going to come together and grow together mm -hmm. is to learn from each other um, because dividing and conquering is not what's working. You know, yeah. that's, not what's going to, that's not what's going to solve the problems. Yeah, that's right. And I, I may get to this in, in a future, one of the next couple of sermons, but I have intentionally subscribed to two very thoughtful news and commentary sources, one of which is left-leaning, the other is uh, right-leaning from uh, – uh, like from a, a philosophy of governance point of view. And I'm reading both of those uh, whenever I read news. And that's been helpful to me to, uh, to be sure that I'm listening to everyone. Um, that's all the questions. I got a text just now that said that's all the questions we got from the online <laughs> okay, portion okay. of it. What, um, what, did pe what would people be interested in hearing from you? That, that, uh, uh, or, or is there a question from anybody here? You guys hung around for a minute. Do you have a question? For Brian, not me, I've talked enough. <laughs> I enjoyed this opportunity for you to do this. And uh, as I've said, uh, Lake Forest loves on the community so well. And uh, Lake Forest loves on the underserved communities in Huntersville so well. Um, the name comes up all the time. It's not that I'm just partial because I'm uh -huh. a ministry partner here. Uh -huh. um, but being out on uh, answering calls and being out in the public, we hear Lake Forest name all the time. Wow. So for those of you listening at home and the people that stuck around in here, I say it all the time. Well done. Well done on loving your community that you're around. Well, and you're a part of that. Thank you for the ways you guys serve in Ketropolis uh, on the worship team. I always love it when I see you up here. Um, but we love our Huntersville Police Department. I'm, I'm very proud of the policing uh, that you guys do uh, and your reputation here, and I'd love to see more of it nationally so um hey that's probably plenty of time and by the way your pandemic beard is awesome i'm Thank jealous you, sir. that's sharp man gi joe looking somebody <laughs> all right hey everybody is it rika is that good okay hey thanks for sticking around for a few minutes and brian i really appreciate you being here uh, uh on our justice sunday cool. bye